Hi, my name is Brian, and welcome to the first episode of Reading Books in Bed. The first book I will be reading is The Go-Getter by Peter B. Kine, a story that tells you how to be one. It was first published in 1921, a story about a war veteran who convinces a business owner to give him a job, and then continually meets or exceeds seemingly insurmountable obstacles. I will be reading one chapter a day. Uh, there are only five chapters. It's only 60 pages long. If you would like to read along yourself or have your own copy to read later, in the description below, I will be putting... Uh, it will be an affiliate link for Amazon to buy this. There's also, if you do not want the physical copy, they have a free Kindle version at the moment. It may not may not be free in the future, I don't know. And there are other copies as well. This one, when I bought it, it was 360 shipped by Sold by Amazon, Prime eligible. So it's not very expensive. I hope you enjoy. And here we go. Dedication. This little book is dedicated to the memory of my dead chief, Brigadier General Leroy S. Lyon, sometime commander of the 65th Field Artillery Brigade, 40th Division, United States Army. Practiced and preached a religion of loyalty to the country and the appointed task, whatever it might be. <clears throat> Chapter 1. Mr. Alden P. Ricks, known in Pacific Coast wholesale lumber and shipping circles as Cappy Ricks, had more troubles than a hen with ducklings. He remarked as much to Mr. Skinner, president and general manager of the Ricks Logging and Lumbering Company, the corporate entity which represented Cappy's vast lumber interests, and he fairly barked the information at Captain Matt Peasley, his son-in-law and also president and manager of the Blue Star Navigation Company, another corporate entity which represented the Ricks' interests in the American Mercantile Marine. Mr. Skinner received this information in silence. He was not related to Cappy Ricks, but Matt Peasley sat down, crossed his legs, and matched glares with his mer Curial father-in-law. You have troubles, he jeered, with emphasis on the pronoun. Have you got a misery in your back, or is Herbert Hoover the wrong man for Secretary of Commerce? Stow your sarcasm, young feller, Cappy shrilled. You know dad blamed well it isn't a question of health or politics. It's the fact that in my old age I find myself totally surrounded by the choicest aggregation Mental duds since Ajax defied the lightning. Meaning whom? You and Skinner. Why, what have we done? You argued me into taking on the management of 25 of those infernal shipping board freighters, and no sooner do we have them allocated to us than a near panic hits the country. Freight rates go to glory, marine engineers go on strike, and every infernal young whelp we send out to take charge of one of our offices in the Orient promptly gets the swelled head and thinks he's divinely ordained to drink up all the synthetic scotch whiskey manufactured in Japan for the benefit of thirsty Americans. In my old age, you two have forced us into the position of having to fire folks by cable. Why? Because we're breaking into a game that can't be played on the home grounds. A lot of our business is so far away we can't control it. Matt Peasley leveled an accusing finger at Cappy Ricks. We never argued you into taking over the management of those shipping board boats. We argued me into it. I'm the goat. You you have nothing to do with it. You retired ten years ago. All the troubles in the marine end of this shop belong in my capable shoulders. Old settler. Theoretically, yes. Actually, no. I hope you do not expect me to abandon mental as well as physical effort. Great wampus cats. I am to be denied a sentimental interest in matters where I have a controlling financial interest. I admit you two boys are running my affairs, and ordinarily you run them rather well. But, but, 
Um, what's the matter with you, Matt? And you also, Skinner. If Matt makes a mistake, it's your job to remind him of it before he re the results manifest themselves, is it not? And vice versa. Have you two boobs lost your ability to judge men, or did you ever have such ability? You're referring to Henderson of the Shanghai office, I dare say, Mr. Skinner cut in. I am Skinner, and I'm here to remind you that if we'd stuck to our own game, which is coast-wise shipping, and had left the Trans-Pacific field with its general co cargoes to others, we wouldn't have any Shanghai office at this moment, and we would not be pestered by the Hendersons of this world. He's the best lumber salesman we've ever had, Mr. Skinner defended. I had every hope that he would send us orders for many a cargo for Asiatic delivery. And he had gone through every job in this office, from office boy to sales manager in the lumber department, and from freight clerk to passenger agent in the navigation company, Matt Teasley supplemented. I admit all of that, but did you consult me when you decided to send him out to China on his own? Of course not. I'm the boss of Blue Star Navigation, am I not? The man was in charge of the Shanghai office before you ever opened your mouth to just discharge your cargo of free advice. I told you then that Henderson wouldn't make good, didn't I? You did. And now I have an opportunity to tell you the little tale you didn't give me an opportunity to tell you before you sent him out. Henderson was a good man, a crackerjack man, when he had a better man over him. But... I've been 20 years reducing a tendency on the part of that fellow's head to bust his hat band, and now he's gone south with 130,000 tails of our Shanghai bank account. Permit me to remind you, Mr. Ricks, Mr. Skinner cut in coldly, that he was bonded to the extent of a quarter of a million dollars. Not a peep out of you, Skinner, not a peep. Permit me to remind you that I'm the little genius who placed that insurance unknown to you and Matt. And I recall now that I was reminded by you, Matthew, my son, that I had retired ten years ago, and please, would I quit interfering in the infernal administration of your office? Well, I must admit, your farsightedness in that instance will keep the Shanghai office out of the red ink this year, Matt Teasley replied. However, we face this situation, Cappy. Henderson has drunk and gambled and signed chits in excess of his salary. He hasn't attended to business, and he's capped his inefficiency by absconding with our bank account. We couldn't foresee that. When we send a man out to the Orient to be our manager there, we have to trust him all the way or not at all. So there is no use weeping over spilled milk, Cappy. Our job is to select a successor to Henderson and send him out to Shanghai on the next boat. Oh, very well, Matt. Cappy replied magnanimously. I'll not rub it into you. I suppose I'm far from generous, bawling you out like this. Perhaps when you're my age and have a lot of mental and moral cripples nip you and draw blood as often as they've drawn it on me, you'll be a better judge than I of men worthy of the weight of responsibility. Skinner, have you got a candidate for this job? Rick, I forget to say, sir, I have not. All of the men in my department are quite young, too young for the responsibility. What do you mean, young, Cappy blazed? Well, the only man I would consider for the job is Andrews, and he is too young, about 30, I should say. About 30, eh? Strikes me you were about 28 when I threw 10000 a year at you in actual cash and a couple of million dollars worth of responsibility. Yes, sir, but then Andrews has never been tested. Skinner, Cappy interrupted in his most awful voice. It's a constant source of amazement to me why I refrain from firing you. You say Andrews has never been tested? Why hasn't he been tested? Why are we maintaining untested material in the shop anyhow? Hey, eh? Answer me that, tut tut tut. Not a peep out of you, sir. If you had done your Christian duty, you would have taken a year's vacation when lumber was selling itself in 1919 or 1920, and you would have left Andrews sitting in at your desk to see the sort of stuff he's made of. It's a mighty lucky thing I didn't go away for a year, Skinner protested respectfully, because the market broke like that, and if you don't think we have to hustle the sell sufficient lumber to keep our own ships busy freighting it. 
Skinner, how dare you contradict me? How old was Matt Peasley when I turned over the Blue Star Navigation Company to him, lock, stock, and barrel? Why, he was 26 years old. Skinner, you're a dodo. The killjoys like you who have straddled the neck of industry and throttled it with absurd theories that a man's back must be bent like an oxbow and his locks snowy white before he can be entrusted with responsibility and a living wage have caused all of our wars and strikes. This is a young man's world, Skinner, and don't you ever forget it. The go-getters of this world are under 30 years of age, Matt, he concluded, turning to his son-in-law. What do you think of Andrews for that Shanghai job? I think he'll do. Why do you think he'll do? Because he ought to do. He's been with us long enough to have acquired sufficient experience to enable him. Has he acquired the courage to tackle the job, Matt? Cappy interrupted. That's more important than his doggone experience you and Skinner prayed so much about. I know nothing of his courage. I assume that he has force and initiative. I know he has a pleasing personality. Well, before we send him out, we ought to know whether or no he has force and initiative. Then, quoth Matt Peasley, rising, I wash my hands of the job of selecting Henderson's successor. You've butted in, so I suggest you name the lucky man. Yes, indeed, Skinner agreed. I'm sure it's quite beyond my poor abilities to uncover Andrew's force and initiative on such notice. He does possess sufficient force and initiative for his present job, but... But will he possess force and initiative when he has to make a quick decision 6,000 miles from expert advice and sand or fall by that decision? That's what we want to know, Skinner. I suggest, sir, Mr. Skinner replied, with chill politeness, that you conduct the examination. I accept the nomination, Skinner, by the holy pink-toed prophet. The next man we send out to that Shanghai office is going to be a go-getter. We've had three managers go rotten on us, and that's three too many. And without further ado, Cappy swung his aged legs up onto his desk and slid down in his swivel chair until he rested on his spine. His head sank on his breast, and he closed his eyes. He's framing the examination for Andrews, Matt Peasley whispered, as he and Skinner made their exit. Thanks for watching and tune in next time.